Friends, there are sometimes when we gather in this place when we have worshiped at a different level, <laughs> where you, you, you sense the truth of the words that we just heard sung, that he really is here. There's a stillness in the sanctuary. There is a presence here that is palpable, and it is the presence of the Lord. Sometimes I feel like old Isaiah who goes into the temple and, and you experience the, the palpable presence of the divine and you just want to shut up. You just want to keep your med- touch my tongue with a fiery coal, Lord, because what can you say in the presence of such presence except hallelujah. Today, we are in the middle of a series, which means I got to talk. I do have to say something, so speak to me. Speak to me, Lord. I'm going to ask you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews in in your New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And on the way there, as you're turning to chapter 10 of the letter to the Hebrews, may I encourage you pastor to people. There are two events this week where I really, I really want you to be here in this sanctuary. The first is this afternoon. You know, our student choir will be singing, but most of the time in our typical consumer-minded culture, we think, I don't have any kids in this choir, so good luck. I'll pray for them and good for them. I hope it goes well. But I tell you, the sanctuary will be filled with people today, this afternoon at three o'clock, whose children and grandchildren are on platform and they may or may not have any connection to our church. And I can tell you there is no kind of love like the kind of love that someone else gives to my children and my own family, right? And so if you are free for about 45 minutes this afternoon at three o'clock, would you come and celebrate other people's kids so that they may feel a sense of love that you and I know intimately in this place? The other is Thursday night. Thursday night, I'm telling you, you really do not want to miss this event. I know I say that about a lot of events around here, but I really mean this. This will be a powerful night of music, and your presence here will make it all the more powerful. 6.30 for the music before the actual concert, 7 o'clock for the concert, an opportunity to love people in this house that we get to call our spiritual home. And that's what we've been talking about these past few weeks. 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road. That's the name of the series, 6910. That's our spiritual home right here. And we've been pursuing this truth that has always been true, and that is that the the church of Christ, the church in the world, is the visible evidence of the risen Christ in the world. That means that you and I, as followers of Jesus, we are the best and only evidence of his resurrection. Our changed lives, our transformed lives are the evidences that he really is alive. And this series, we've been talking about what it means to be alive at this address. If it's time for the post-pandemic body of Christ to rise, what will it look like to truly rise here at 6910? I was thinking about I was thinking about Bill recently, Bill Self. We've had so many people join the church these past few months and the last couple of years that maybe you don't know and were not a friend of Bill Self, my predecessor, longtime pastor of Johns Creek Baptist Church and an incredible leader and pastor and friend. And he would say every time a new member would join this fellowship, he'd stand right up here and say to him or her, I need three things from you. You can say them with me. I need you to be here when we're here, join a small group, and what else? Help carry the load. That's right. By serving, by giving, by lifting up the thing that God is attempting to do here. Today, thank you, Bill. I want to focus on that first one for just a few moments, being here when we're here. A couple of weeks ago, I put my hands on a new report that's out by the Public Religion Research Institute. We've been following this group for years and years. For as long as I've been your pastor, we've been studying the work of this group of people who study us and our religious ways in this country. 
And over the past several years, especially since their latest report in 2015, 2016, we've been talking about the trends that we see in who we call the nuns, those who have no affiliation with church, and the duns, those who used to have an affiliation but walked away. They're now done with it. And we've talked about the challenges that the Church of Christ faces today in this nation when it comes to rising up to our identity as the risen Christ in this world. Recently, they came up with a new report. It came out last May, and it's fascinating, and the trends continue. But two data points I found got down in my soul, and I couldn't, it wouldn't leave me alone. The first is this, of all the folks who say that they are religious in this country, of all the folks who say that faith is a part of their lives, only two out of 10 say it's the most important part of their lives. And I hear the Apostle Paul whisper to me, for to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. And yet, eight out of 10 people recognize, I have faith. Yeah, yeah, I put it right here. It's inside here. It's somewhere on me. I have faith. It's just not the most important thing. And that explains the next data point. That when it comes to attendance, to being here when we are here, the, the decline has continued that less than 24% of all Americans attend any kind of religious service on any kind of regularity week to week to week. That's down six points since I became your pastor in 2013. Nationwide, we have downgraded our frequency in attendance by six points in 10 years. And the trend is forecasted to continue. So, As I talk and imagine and ruminate and cogitate and pontificate on on all that it means for this church to rise up in this current day at at 6910, I want to preach to you for just a moment on a very simple subject. The title of the message is very simple. And it is this, why your frequent, faithful, physical attendance at 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road is more important than you can possibly think or imagine. That is the title, hashtag that. (laughs) In other words, why it is critical to be here when we are here. From Hebrews chapter 10, would you hear these words? Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love. And good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I want to talk to you this morning about why your frequent, faithful, physical attendance at 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road is more important than you could possibly think or imagine. But before I say a word about all that, I have to give you two disclaimers. Two disclaimers. This is not, this is not your grandfather's guilt sermon. There is a crucial reason why being in the same room, breathing the same air, will matter if this body is to truly rise. So two disclaimers. The first is this message is not directed at those of you who are at home and cannot get out. Some of you, I know, because of physical limitations, you lean into what we're doing here every week and it grieves you that you cannot physically be here. And by God's good grace, we've been given the the blessing of a production ministry that is able to keep you connected to us. I'm not talking to you. I give thanks that you're able to be with us if you physically cannot be here. Amen? Yeah. Disclaimer number two, I'm also not talking to you if you don't live nearby, but however, nearby is a relative term. 
do you know we have a family? And because the, 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 the lights are in my eyes, I, I, and don't turn them off, but I don't, I don't know if they're here today, but almost every Sunday, we have a family who drives almost an hour one way to be here every Sunday. You know why? So they can be in the room where it happens. And so I'm not talking about those who live so far away that they can't get here. In fact, this week I, I wrote a note to a young man who grew up in our church. He lives in Minnesota. He keeps watching every Sunday. He began this week giving a recurring financial gift to his home church, although he lives states away. Now, there's a way to stay connected when you're not here, but I'm not talking about those who cannot physically be here. You understand what I'm saying? I'm preaching today to those who make a decision on going to church in the morning based on whether they have a better offer. I'm talking about those who make the decision on whether to show up on this campus based on if the the weather is so pretty, it's just too pretty to stay inside for two hours. Or, Or if it's sprinkling. Or if we had too much of a good time last night, we need some time to recover this morning. Am, am I, is it too much, too soon? I'm just, you know, so I'm talking about the power of being in the room where it happens because he is here. And there's something that happens in this room that cannot happen when we are alone. And I want to talk about that for just a moment. I wonder if we might go old school. Can I verse by verse this thing? First verse, verse 23 says this, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. What does it mean to hold to the confession of our hope? What is the confession of our hope? The confession of our hope is simply this, it's what the Jackson girls confessed in the water today. Jesus is Lord. That's the confession that binds us all together, regardless our background or our stories that got us in this room. That's the one thing we have in common. Jesus is Lord, Lord of my life, Lord of the world, Lord of this church, Lord over sin and shame, Lord over death and the grave. He's Lord of all. And as we've said for years, if he is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So our confession of hope that we have is that because of the resurrection of Christ and because he is Lord of this church, then we believe dead things can rise. We believe that dead things can rise. It happens all the time. It happens in the lives of families and individuals in this church, in this community, in this world, all around. Because of the resurrection of Jesus and his victory over death and the grave, it means that the thing in you that has died can rise. That the, that the thing that you lost, it can be found. That whatever it was that broke inside you or whatever it was that you broke because of the resurrection of Jesus, it can be mended. It means that wherever you've been wounded, abused, neglected, isolated, forgotten, invisible to the world, you are seen and you are healed and, and you are found by the one who is the Lord of all. Our confession of hope is that dead things rise in this place. But I find it fascinating that he doesn't simply say in this letter, hey, keep on believing the confession of your hope. Hey, keep talking about the confession of your hope. Keep preaching about the confession of your hope. Keep teaching about the confession of your hope. He says what? Hold fast. Hold fast to the confession of your hope. The word in Greek is is this word. It's kateko. Kateko is a word in Greek that means to hold back, to hold tight, to secure, to keep from being possessed. The insinuation is that you are to hold on to this like you would hold on to something that can be stolen from your arms. With white knuckles, both hands, the kung fu grip on each hand, you hold on to it as if it can be stolen from you. And why? Because it can. Not your salvation. Not the love of God, which you've had from the very beginning, but your joy, your your awareness of freedom, your your sense of contentment in this world, 
It can be still, and then it occurs to me the context in which he is writing. You know, he's writing to a group of, of, of listeners, of readers, of Christians who lived in a context of great persecution. They lived in a context in which the culture around them was hostile to the message of the cross that was in them. There was a cult, and I, I begin to wonder, what, what, Paul, what's that, what's that look like? I wonder what it looks like to have lived at a time, I don't know, in which you live in a culture that has all these forces and energies and powers that would tend to somehow undermine outside of you that faith that is in you. I wonder what that would look like. I wonder what it would look like to have ordered your life in such a way that you are in alignment with the hope of your confession and then you step outside of the context of gathering with others who have that same hope. I wonder what it would look like to then be confronted by every force and power and influence and screen that would call you to live in a way that is out of alignment with that confession of your hope. I don't know what that would look like. But I do know we live at a time in which the moment we leave this place and sometimes before we even leave this place, we are being tugged, pulled, persuaded, tempted, seduced into giving our lives and, our, and the passion of our life to every imitation God. And as we do that, we're, 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 we're tempted to live out of alignment with the one who we have confessed is the confession of our hope, the Lord of our life. So the writer says, you have to hold on with both hands, with, a, with white knuckles to this hope you have because you are living in a world that will threaten to steal the thing that has freed you in this life. And he says, do it without wavering. Ugh. Without wavering. Man, I waver every day. Every day. I wa every day. I, I, like Paul, I do the things I don't want to do. I, I don't do the things that I, that I want to do. And it frustrates me. It's like there's a war within me. And why? Because I'm holding on with both hands. And if I'm by myself, if I'm on my own trying to hold tight to the confession of my hope, my grip is going to slip. That's why I need you. And that's why you need me. If you are isolated and alone and attempting to do your faith as a solo, as a lone ranger, as everybody else may need to gather, but I'm good. I mean, I, 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 I'm God and I do our thing out in nature. We do it on the lake. Well, great, do that too. But I promise you this, if you try to hold fast to the hope that is in you without being tugged one way or another, if you do it alone, your grip will slip. That's why we need each other. That's why we're told to gather with one another. In fact, the next verse, verse 24, takes it a step further. Verse 24 reads this way. It follows 23. And let us consider how to provoke, how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as, the, as you see the day approaching. I find that word fascinating. In, in fact, in the old King James, you know what this says? You know, it, it says here in our text, it says, uh, not neglecting to meet one another. But in the old King James, you know, he used to say, forsake not the assembly of yourselves. I love that. Forsake not the assembly of yourselves. Why? Because there are some things that you can do with, that you cannot do alone. We gather together because in our togetherness, we strengthen the grip that we have on the thing we're holding tight to. <laughs> you know, this means we gotta get in the same room. Early this morning during Sunday school, our children's pastor told me, hey, you, you, you'll get a kick out of this. They didn't know what I was preaching. And, and I, I don't know what they were teaching down with our, our grade school. But Robin, our, our pastor of children, said to them about, you know, an hour ago. This is hot off the press. What is the church? I want you to write it or draw a picture. And 
these pictures were drawn and written. Here's the first one. Our children. It is a group of people who love and gather and serve. Do you see a picture up there? Another picture. Our children said a group of people in a building worshiping and praising God. What? What? Yay, God. I didn't see that part. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yay, God. All right. Third picture, a group of people in a building worshiping and praising God. Another one. And then the number four, the church is a place for Christians to gather and praise God. And the next one comes with some art. Here's a pretty picture. And then after the art, it is a family that praise the Lord. And I'm just leaning in, listening to our children, letting them prophesy to me today, almost intuitively, down at a gut level. What is the church? Oh, it's where we get together. We get together in this building, and we know, we know, theologically, the church doesn't have brick and mortar. But it's interesting to me that the children would say, oh, it's what we do when we get to other, together with other people who love the Lord. That means being together matters. And you know why it matters? Oh gosh. Do you know why it's so important? Because you can't hold on to the thing that you're to hold on to with a grip on your own. I've been reading a lot of our history, church history. We have this book that tells about how this church began in 1875. It's a fascinating read. Do you know that around uh, the first few years of our church, they could only meet about once a month? Because they shared a preacher. They gathered about once a month. And then if you missed church on that one time that they met, you could get voted out of the church. (laughs) And I promise you we have records of in our congregation of people being kicked out of church for not showing up. But that's okay because we're also a place of grace. You know what happened the next month? They voted them back in. Man, I mean, our mothers and fathers in the faith knew something to be true that needs to be said again and again and again. Be here when we're here. And I love why. Because the writer says, when we are together, we provoke one another to love and to good deeds. To provoke. The word in Greek there means to to jab, to stab, to poke, to prod until there is a reaction by the one you're poking and prodding. I remember growing up, you know, we were into martial arts. My family was into boxing. And I would get together with my grandfather who was a referee. And he was the best. And we'd spar. I'd put on the pads. He wouldn't put on any pads. He just held one old leather boxing glove by the end of it. And, and I'd spar, and I'd come up, and he would just, he'd dodge and weave and slip, and then all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> and then, then I'd shake it off, and I'd come back again, and I'd, I'd you know, I'd do, do whatever I, and then, boom, again. Same thing, again and again, to the same side of the head, which explains a lot, I know. <laughs> but he was poking and prodding and provoking me to learn to put up a defense We gather together because our presence with each other pokes, prods, provokes us to learn how to put up a defense against every force outside these walls that may tend to undermine the faith that is practiced inside these walls. We gather together to provoke one another toward. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we gather together, the thing about the Christian church, which has been true from the very beginning, is there is no other gathering like it because we have one confession, Jesus is Lord. But that means that we are cosmically a multinational, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual body worldwide. That means when we gather in here, we have microcosmic expressions of all of that gathered together. We are male and female. We 
we are black and white and brown and we are old and young and we are liberal and conservative and we are new at the faith and long time serving in the faith. And when we gather in the same room, something powerful happens. I see you and you see me and you see each other. And the more frequent, frequently we gather with each other, the more we know about the, the stories that we bring into this place. Because I know what some of you bring into this room. Because you've told me. And every time we gather here, the more we know one another, the more we recognize, oh, that's, she's the one who has gone through a, another round of chemo. And there she is. Headscarf, brave, with dignity coming in to still be hmm. oh I know them that's the couple that's the couple and their their child is in active recovery again because they almost lost him last time yeah I'm, I know I know him he, he, this is his first time in the sanctuary after her funeral and all he can see is her I see I see him and suddenly when we see each other and all the weight of all the burden that we bring into this room, all of our gains and all of our losses, all that we are grieving and all that we're celebrating, something happens. Your presence in this room provokes something of a perspective of faith. I just remember several weeks ago, and I told you a little bit about it. Our children are up here singing, and they're singing, um, what's the name of that song? All My Life, what's the, what do you call that? The goodness of God. And we got this whole choir up here, and they're singing, you know, All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Yeah. And I'm on the front row, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching. But what fascinates me is not just the, the words they're singing. These steps are populated with students of all ages even down to five and six years old, and I'm sitting about seven, eight feet away from a five or six-year-old singing at the top of his or her lungs, all my life, you have been faithful. All seven years of my life, you have been so, so good. And then it occurs to me, tears are running down my face, and they're, my face, and they're looking at, at, at Miss Beth, but they're cutting their eyes at me like, what's wrong with Pastor Sean today? Because they're preaching to me, sing, little children, sing. Because you're right. He has been faithful to me. And your song is reminding me of something. Your life is meant to remind somebody else in this room of something that you'll never know about. Your presence here is not just about you. Your presence here and your, your active participation here is about something going on even in, in the lives of other people that you'll never know, but God will use you in you being physically and frequently present here to evoke faith in somebody. Do you know that what we do when we gather in this place has a cosmic impact? When we gather, we proclaim cosmic truths that strengthen the grip that we each hold onto the confession of our faith. Man, we gather around a sacred word. And I say some things about it, but that's just my, my interpretation. That's on you to then interpret. We gather around this word. And somewhere along the way, we recognize that this word, which in the, is in the center of our consciousness in, in this hour, has been read and followed by millennia of mothers and fathers in the faith, and we keep telling the same stories because they work. We keep aligning ourselves to the truth of this word, and suddenly, when we are frequently and faithfully, physically present in this room, the multiplicity of those exposures to the sacred word means that I am reminded in a, in a life of loneliness that I am not alone. I am a part of a story, a sacred story. I have a family narrative, whether I know my mother's name or my father's name or not, because this is my family, and we gather around and we not only preach, but we sing. And we sing songs that make us aware of the palpable presence of the divine in this sanctuary. And something happens in us. And then we baptize people. And every time we baptize someone, we watch these girls up here preach to us by their confession of faith. And then we're reminded by the words of Paul, 
anything, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. All the old has passed and everything new has come. And the more frequently we gather to watch that happen, the more I am reminded the thing that is dying in me will live again. All the things that I regret in my past are in the past. Behold, there is a new creation in me. And we break bread and we drink a cup. And when we break bread and drink a cup, we literally consume the character of the one whose brokenness has made us whole. See, something happens in this room that can't happen simply on your own, alone in this life. We need each other. In a way, do you know what it's been described in the past? The church has been described as an outpost of heaven. An embassy of the eternal. You know, if you're in a foreign country and and you run into some trouble, you lost your passport or you're under some kind of threat, you find your way to the American embassy and in a way, in an American embassy on that plot of soil, you are on American territory. You have found a home away from home. If you don't realize the power of walking into an American embassy that you really are in a home away from home, I need to introduce you to some U.S. Marines who treat it like it's their backyard. Church is an embassy of the eternal. And what happens here in this space every Sunday, whether you happen to be here or not, is that heaven comes down and glory fills this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. So be here. I'm reminded of the power of what can happen on a Sunday morning in a gathered community. When I think about Fred Craddock, it's 12 o'clock, but you're going to want to hear the story. Fred Craddock was a hero of preachers. He literally wrote the books on preaching that a whole generation learned to preach from. He was a hero of preachers. But when he was young... He grew up in West Tennessee, small boy, uh, single mom, uh, poor. And in the place where he lived, they, they lived so far away from a real church that they had to have church in their own home. And that's okay because every Saturday night, Fred, little Fred, and his mother would invite a few of the neighbors over to their home where they would sit down on the floor in their main room. It's okay because one of them had a harmonica. Somebody else brought a hymn book that on the front said, hymn book number two. And they sang, bringing in the sheaves, old rugged cross, standing on the promises. And every Saturday night, they would make him dress up in his best clothes, which means his, his, uh, his clean, uncomfortable clothes. And they would sit in the middle of that floor and they would sing. And one of the couples who came over every Saturday was Will and Mary Hunt. Will and Mary Hunt were an African-American couple in their late 80s, maybe even early 90s. And they're there and they're sitting on the floor and they're singing. And and Fred, little Fred, leans up to old Will one day and says, Will, you ever ever been in a real church? Will said, oh yeah, hundreds of them. He said, well, what's it, what's it like? He said, oh, son, it's the most stupendous, amazing, miraculous thing you've ever seen. Of course, if you ever get a chance to go one day, Fred, you got to go inside. Don't pay attention to the outside, see, because remember, everything God made that was ever good, God disguised. If you go, you got to go inside. And when you go inside, you're going to look up and you're going to see that the ceiling is all blue. And there are all these stars like diamonds shining down from space above. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the angel choir uh, sings. And, and, and the angel choir joins with the church choir. And oh, you're transported, boy. You're transported. A few months after that conversation, little Fred heard the news that old Will had died. They went to his funeral. It was at an old little white painted church not far from from where Will had lived. 
When he went there, Fred walked to the outside and was curious. Paint was chipping, cinder blocks under the front porch. It was hot that day, middle of the summer. The funeral home passed out fans. They opened all the windows to this, this church, and Fred walks inside. He walks inside and, and sees the, the floor that is creaky and old and scuffed up. He sees pews that are wobbly because they had been donated by a church in town. And he looks around in the sky. The ceiling's not blue. No stars. No angels. And Fred remembers thinking to himself as an eight-year-old boy, I ah, will. You kind of messed me up on this whole thing. And then he said something began to happen. It was the first time he had ever been in a real church. He said, the choir started humming. Congregation started humming. The choir started swaying. Congregation started swaying. People started laughing and singing and praying and crying. The mourners started grieving. The prayers started praying. All of a sudden, as the whole church was singing with one another, the preacher started preaching. People were hugging each other who hadn't seen each other in a long time. He said, there was an energy in the room that I'd never expected. And all of a sudden, I looked up. And the sky was all blue. And there were these, these stars like diamonds in the sky. And, and this, this angel chorus that began to sing with the church choir. And I'll be everything that Will said was true. And the band of angels, the band of angels came and sang him to his eternal rest. The reason you and I gather in worship is because we, we find that in this place, this is where heaven touches earth. This is where the veil is so thin you can see through it. Why would you want to miss a single moment of that? So maybe today, you're here today and you, you realize for the first time in a long time, I need this place. I need these people. I need a space where I can recognize that I cannot on my own hold on to the thing that I fear losing. I need the help of your grip and your grip so that together we may be able to hold fast to the confession of our hope when we leave this place. If you're here today and you're, you're in a place where you feel the, the call of God to respond to you, but you don't know what to do about it, I pray that you would take a moment right where you're sitting and you yield yourself to the one who makes the mundane holy, to the one who can turn a secular sanctuary into a cathedral of the sacred. Today, maybe you pray these words right where you are in your own heart, God. I recognize that I've been attempting to do faith on my own for some time. I, I, I confess to you that even my best attempt keeps me wavering back and forth and I lose my grip. And, I, and yet today, I recognize I need you. And I need the community of believers who call you Lord to strengthen me. And I commit myself this day to be here when we are all here. To bring my full self, my whole life to this place so that you may strengthen the grip of all of us as we witness for you in this world. And I give you that, Lord because you are the only Lord of my life. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, friends, you may have prayed that prayer or some kind of prayer that sounded a little like it. 
If you did, you need to know you've made the first most important step of your faith journey. But there is a second, to tell somebody about it. That's why our pastors are coming forward in the sanctuary to sit or to stand at the beginning or the front of the sanctuary to meet you, to listen to you, to pray with you. It may be that today you come to say to them, I think I have just received Christ as my Lord. I believe I have yielded to him fully now and we'll talk to you about what your next step is. It may be that you come today saying, I recognize I am his and he is mine, but I've never walked through the waters of baptism to proclaim to the world that I am his. You come and tell us and we will guide you into that next step of faith. Or it may be it's time for you to join this church to stop thinking about it and putting it off and come forward to say, I want the same energy that is transforming this place to transform me. I wanna be one of your sister or brothers in the faith. And you come and talk to us today and we'll guide you through that next step. Whatever the decision may be, I pray that at the conclusion of this benediction, you'll not wait another week. You come forward by faith. But now, It is time for us to do what we have gathered here to do. We gather in order to scatter and to live in a way outside these walls that demonstrates we actually believe the things we've affirmed inside these walls. So as you're able, would you stand to your feet for your benediction? You may choose to join the hand of someone near you as I speak these words over you for your week ahead. Wherever it is that you may go, may Christ, the living one, go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step forward at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days when dark clouds roll in to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word, may Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his.